Bushido, a term that continues to captivate the imagination of the modern mind. A warrior code, a way of life. From a time where samurai, the warrior aristocracy of Japan, upheld an ancient cultural identity. But what exactly was Bushido? Well, let's find out. Let's go back long, long ago and start from the beginning. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's great to have you back with me again. If you'd like to support the channel, perhaps you should follow the links to the Patreon in the descriptions and the comments. Otherwise, a like, comment, and subscribe certainly goes a long way. Now, without further ado, on to today's topic. Now, before we get into a more chronological history of the concept of Bushido, let's define our terms. What exactly is it? The concept of Bushido is often simplified as a singular moral code that all samurai were obliged to follow. However, historical evidence reveals that samurai adhere to multiple warrior codes, and interpretations varied significantly among the different clans, individuals, and eras. These codes and philosophies evolved over time, reflecting changing societal norms and values. Since at least the Kamakura period, various proto-Bushido types had existed, with degrees of devoutness and interpretations differing among individual samurai. These samurai did not uniformly adhere to a specific set of rules and behaviors, and their actions were influenced by their personal beliefs, clan traditions, and their circumstances of the time. One must remember, yes, they were samurai, but they're also human beings. And just as the knight's code in our European tradition was found to be somewhat restrictive, well, Bushido was no different. Samurai customs included practices that might be considered somewhat dark or brutal by modern standards. For example, just to quickly name a few of them, they had the right to strike lower-class individuals who dishonored them. Of course, dishonoring them was somewhat left up to the individual's interpretation. There was also the ritual seppuku, which was used to restore one's honor or die in an honorable way, a tradition that was held all the way up to the Second World War. Other practices, such as Tsujigiri, which translates roughly to crossroads killing, where a samurai would, after receiving his blade, test it on a random civilian of his choice. Head collection was also observed, as a kind of trophy-taking. Although they were not condoned by any particular samurai clan, but it certainly did happen. The comparison between Bushido and Western codes of chivalry, often likening samurai to knights, reveals both similarities and differences. While chivalry was influenced by Christianity, Bushido drew from Zen Buddhism, Shinto, and Confucianism. Additionally, Bushido, as popularized by Nitobe Inazo in his book Bushido, the Soul of Japan, represents a rather romanticized interpretation that differs from other historical literature by samurai. The concept of chivalric Bushido, as defined by Nitobe, was invented in the 19th century. 
However, there is ample historical literature on Japanese warrior codes, practices, and philosophies, dating all the way back to the Kamakura period. These variations can be categorized into different eras, including Sengoku, Edo, Meiji, and contemporary Bushido. So, the concept in itself, this code of conduct followed by the samurai class in feudal Japan and to a lesser extent in later times, traces its origins back to the 12th century. During this period, under the rule of Shogun Minamoto Yoritomo, unwritten customs began to shape the behavior and ethics of the warrior class. These very early principles were centered around the virtues of courage, loyalty, and of course, self-discipline, emphasizing the importance of honor in battle and service to one's lord. But the actual term, Bushido, itself appears first in written records in the Koyogunkan, a text dating to around 1616, that chronicles the military exploits of the Takeda clan. However, the foundations of Bushido were laid much, much earlier, evolving alongside the development of feudal Japan. Now, all the way back to the Heian period, that was from 794 to around 1185, this laid the groundwork for Bushido through the establishment of a class-based morality system. During this time, the imperial court held nominal authority, supported by a bureaucratic aristocracy. However, the rise of the samurai class, particularly during the Genpei War, that's from around 1180 to 85, led to a shift in power. Minamoto no Yoritomo emerged as the de facto ruler, establishing the first shogunate in Kamakura in 1192. With the rise of the samurai and the centralization of power under the shogunate, Bushido began to take shape as a distinct code of conduct for warriors. While its early manifestations were primarily focused on martial prowess and battlefield honor, Bushido gradually evolved to encompass broader moral principles, including integrity, compassion, and self-discipline. By the 14th and 15th centuries, Bushido had become firmly entrenched in samurai culture, influencing not only their actions on the battlefield, but also their behavior in everyday life. It was during this period that Bushido began to be codified in military treatises and literature, cementing its status as a guiding philosophy for the warrior class. During the 10th and 11th centuries, distinct paths of warrior training and combat began to emerge, laying the groundwork for what would later become known as synonymous with the term Bushido. Now these paths included the Way of the Man-at-Arms, Tsuamon no Michi, and the Way of the Bow and Arrows, Kyuya no Michi. These practices were focused on the more practical aspects of combat training, and initially did not carry any further moral implications. But by the time of this Genpei War, the importance of archery and horsemanship led to the emergence of the way of the bow and horse as a dominant style of combat among samurai. This term reflected the traditional methods of combat employed by legendary samurai heroes such as Prince Shotoku, Minamoto no Yorimitsu, and Minamoto no Yoshie. The way of the bow and horse 
appeared around the 10th century as a set of rules and customs that were somewhat of an expectation for aspiring samurai. Additionally, there were specific customs that were related to archery known as Yumiya Toru no Mi Narai, further illustrating the emerging sense of ideal warrior shaped by training and warfare experience. Now it began to change around the medieval period, around the 12th to the 16th centuries, as the world of warrior culture in Japan became increasingly influenced by Buddhism. Buddhist principles, such as the prohibition of killing living beings and the notion of impermanence, began to shape the ethical and spiritual outlook of the samurai. Some samurai grappled with the moral implications of their actions, while others sought solace in beliefs, such as the pure land of Buddha Amida, or the Zen Buddhist doctrine of oneness between life and death. Despite the spiritual and ethical complexities they faced, the world of medieval warriors remained deeply intertwined with the supernatural. Beliefs in tormented souls of fallen warriors, and the hope for salvation in the afterlife permeated samurai culture, contributing to the rich tapestry of beliefs and practices that defined their class at this age. This ideal of the cultivated warrior, exemplified by the samurai class, found its literary portrayal in works such as The Tale of the Heike, which depicts the epic struggle of the Genpei War between the Minamoto and Taira clans. This idealized portrayal is somewhat of a romanticized form of what the samurai actually was, but it certainly managed to embody the essence of the ideal of Bushido, and therefore this work became a cornerstone of Japanese culture. Now, by this time, the term Bushido around the Kamakura period had really taken on a proper meaning. From the days of the Kamakura shogunate onward, the way of the warrior became so deeply ingrained in Japanese society that the country itself earned the reputation as a warrior nation. And the samurai weren't just sword-wielding warriors. At this point, they'd been seen as somewhat of role models, embodying the principles of Confucianism by balancing martial prowess with pursuits such as literature, poetry, and, of course, the tea ceremony. A popular medieval Japanese proverb, Hanawa Sakuragi Hitawabushi, the best blossom is the cherry blossom, and the best man is the warrior, reflects the societal esteem for the samurai class. This sentiment was echoed by Nakamura in 1843, highlighting the cultural dichotomy between nation of arms like Japan and nations of letters such as China. Of course, 1843, China were not doing so well. If you want to look at their military now, well, perhaps they're not just a nation of letters. Of course, the influence of Shinto, Buddhism, Taoism and Confucianism on the development of Bushido instilled in inheritance this kind of religious reverence for the code. During the Muromachi period, 1336 to 1573, Bushido underwent a refinement. Samurai warriors began to incorporate Zen meditation, painting in monochrome style, Ikebana, that's flower arrangement, tea ceremony, 
poetry, and literature into their daily activities. These pursuits aim to cultivate not only physical prowess, but mental and spiritual fortitude. In the 13th and 14th century writings known as Gunki Monogatari, the Bushi were depicted in their natural element of war, with virtues such as reckless bravery, fierce family pride, and unwavering loyalty to their masters extolled. However, alongside the virtues, of course, was that tale of Heike, which emphasized civic virtues such as loyalty, steadfastness in adversary, and pride in family honor. And this is a little different from what we saw in China, with the Shaolin monks, for example. Indeed, there are mainly two kinds of monks, warrior monks and spiritual monks, and one must somewhat concentrate on a certain path, while the samurai were expected to do both. The Warring States Period Sengoku, in the Japanese vernacular, saw the recording and transmission of sayings of prominent retainers and warlords, including figures like Kato Kiyomasa. In his handbook, addressed to all samurai, Kato emphasized the importance of daily reflection on the principles of Bushido, stating that without such contemplation, it would be difficult to meet death with bravery and dignity. He advocated for a single-minded focus on the virtues of loyalty, filial piety, and martial prowess, asserting that these were the essential qualities for a warrior's life. Kato himself was known for his ferocity in battle, but also his strict adherence to the more gentle principles of Bushido, certainly seen as quite a role model among those who were in the same game. He discouraged, however, pursuits such as poetry recitation, urging samurai to rather dedicate themselves wholeheartedly to matters of learning, instead of just repeating the old things over and over again, but particularly those related to military strategy and moral virtues. For Kato, being born into the warrior class meant embracing the sword, and also being prepared to sacrifice one's life for the ideals of loyalty and duty, and he expected all other samurai to feel the same. Another samurai, Nabeshima Naoshige, from 1538 to 1618, echoed sentiments similar to Gato Kiyomasa, and he emphasized the importance of risking one's life in battle, regardless of rank. He therefore regarded Bushido as embodying the willingness to face death fearlessly, asserting that even fifty men would struggle to defeat such a warrior who truly held the Bushido principles as the top priority. However, Naoshige also recognized the value of experiencing exertion and hardship firsthand, advocating for a personal understanding of the struggles faced by those in the lower classes. By the mid-16th century, Japan was plunged into a period of intense conflict, and powerful warlords vied for supremacy over territories amid the declining influence of the Kyoto government. This era of turmoil culminated with the capture of Kyoto by the warlord Oda Nobunaga in 1573, marking the end of the Muromachi period. In 1551, 
the Roman Catholic missionary Francis Xavier provided one of the earliest Western descriptions of Japan. He observed that honor, weaponry, and warfare held paramount importance in Japanese culture. The Japanese, of course, valued military glory and martial prowess above all else, dedicating themselves to the adornment and mastery of arms. Their warlike nature was evident in their continuous internal conflicts and their emphasis on martial virtues. Now on to another grim aspect. The practice of collecting enemy heads as trophies exemplified the notion of honor in samurai culture. Displaying severed heads to a general served as proof of one's bravery and prowess in battle, earning prestige, honor, and generally quite luxurious rewards. This ritualized practice, known as Ohaguro, involved beautifying the severed heads and presenting them ceremoniously to warriors and leaders. So, if this doesn't tell you uh, how the era in general was, and the general culture around warfare in Japan, well, I don't know what to tell you. Certainly turbulent times. Well, despite the nature of this era, the principles of Bushido did persist beyond the battlefield, and they were equally as important. But of course there was a time for everything. They always emphasized the ethical and just behavior, even in times of peace. Now, you're probably thinking, when we just mentioned this head-collecting ritual, that that perhaps does not seem very just. Well, you see, in terms of the strong versus the weak, it is entirely justified to a samurai warrior. That was the logic. In fact, this practice, somewhat gruesomely continued into the Second World War, there is an article from the Muramachi newspaper, and it was effectively in Nanjing, the uh, horrible massacre that took place there, where two Japanese soldiers had a contest of who could collect the most heads, and this contest was set up like a sports competition on the front page of the newspaper that was circulated all over Tokyo during the time. Quite gruesome. But let's get back to Bushido. Forms of Bushido related Zen Buddhism and Confucianism emerged, shaping those moral and social values of the samurai class. Now, a true samurai was expected to uphold principles that were conducive to good conduct, living a life that was guided by honor, integrity, and duty, even in the absence of military campaigns. But of course, when a military campaign was on, he was expected to be incredibly bloodthirsty. Just take a nice bath when you go home, it seems. Now, during the Edo period, that's 1600 to the mid-19th century, Japan experienced a prolonged period of peace under the Tokugawa shogunate. This era of tranquility allowed Bushido to evolve from its focus solely on valor in battle and encompass more broad moral principles and integrity. Of course, if you've got nobody to fight, and things are relatively peaceful, well, it would be against good moral conduct just to simply go starting wars wherever you please. Well, of course, the crossroads killing still existed, but that's a different story. 
Now in terms of the Tokugawa shogunate, they formalized aspects of samurai warrior values into the actual feudal law, codifying the responsibilities and conduct that was expected of the samurai class. Now, the issuance of the Buke Shohato, or laws for military houses in 1615 by the government, and subsequent reissues, underscores the shogunate's authority and control over the warrior aristocracy. Of course, they were the top echelons of the society, but no one was higher than the shogun. Now, during this same period under Tokugawa, the samurai class assumed roles in policing and administering the country, contributing to the maintenance of peace and order. Bushido literature from this time reflects the samurai's contemplation on martial principles and experiences in peacetime, as well as reflections on the nature's history of warfare, with some samurai looking back on it and kind of wishing they had a chance to show off their skills. Notable works from this era include Shoke no Hyoko by Ogasawa Rasakun, Budo Shoshinshu by Taira Shikusuke, and Daidoji Yuzan. These texts delve into the philosophy and ethics of Bushido, and really each one of them is so involved that they really need their own video. Just as the Book of Five Rings, which I have made a video of Miyamoto Mashashi, if you would like to go and watch that one. It's in the pile somewhere. Now, it was around this time, a little bit earlier in Tokugawa's reign, that we had that text, Koyogunkan, where the term written down Bushido first appears in 1616. This text was written by a samurai, a quite notable one, Kosaka Masanobu, and it further exemplifies the uh, emphasis on valor and exploits in battle, portraying a Bushido in its ideal form. It also advocates for the unwavering dedication to martial pursuits, but, of all, loyalty to one's lord, even when one did not like it. During the Edo period and beyond, the concept of Bushido continued to evolve and be shaped by the various philosophical and new cultural influences. Now, the one thing that the Koyogunkan does is provides one of the earliest comprehensive insights and the value system of the samurai tradition. However, Bushido is not bound by this rigid set of principles deemed to be true or false, but it rather encompasses varying perceptions that have been formidable throughout different centuries. Now, as articulated by some modern martial arts scholars, such as Thomas Cleary, Bushido draws selectively from elements of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Shinto to find this comfortable medium of discipline of the warrior that also fits into Japanese culture. Of course, there are culture and customs, but when we're taking from Buddhism and Confucianism, there are certain things that may not match up with the politics of the time. For example, it's hard to get Buddhists excited about going to war when they're not meant to be harming any living creature. So, of course, these different ethics are always going to be subject to politics. And, once again, the loyalty to one's lord is going to overtake everything. 
Now going back a little bit, during the Genna era, it was from 1615 to 1624 of the Edo period and beyond, the concept of the way of the gentleman gained quite a lot of prominence. It's a Shido in Japanese. Now particularly through the efforts of the philosopher and strategist Yamaga Soko. Yamaga Soko and others sought to explain this value within the framework of Confucian ethics, emphasizing virtues such as humanity and filial piety as completely essential for the samurai. The compilation of works such as Shoko no Hyogo by Okasawa Rasakun further elucidated the essence of Bushido. In this work, these old scrolls, that we're very, very lucky to have, by the way, since they went through the ringer, Bushido is described as Iji, or willpower in our vernacular, emphasizing the strength to adhere to the personal convictions, despite external rewards or power. Of course, we all know about the master swordsman, Miyamoto Masashi, whose life effectively is Bushido. If Bushido had manifested as a living, breathing person, it would certainly be Miyamoto Masashi. He was renowned for his expertise in martial arts, and authored the Book of Five Rings around 1643, available at all good bookstores, by the way. You can read it in one sitting, too. It's not long. Well, in one of the five volumes, the Book of Earth, Musashi emphasizes the importance of applying skills in any situation, mastering various weapons, devoting oneself to training and maintaining ethical conduct. Now furthermore, it wasn't just Musashi writing these books. In 1685, the book Kokon Bushido Ezukushi by the artist Hishikawa Moronobu was published. It was an ukiyo-e book. Now it's a kind of style of Japanese paintings. Quite nice actually and it features these beautiful depictions of heroic tales of samurai warriors and the simple descriptions that went along with the artwork. Well, this publication was actually intended for children to inspire them to great deeds as they were growing up, provide some moral guidance. Now, moving on to the earliest 20th century, we have the Chinese politician Dai Jitao, who studied in Japan during the early 20th century, and he offers insights into the evolution of Bushido and its impact on Japanese society from a bit of a different cultural lens. You see, Dai criticized the violent nature of traditional Japanese feudalism, but also did acknowledge the positive aspects of samurai virtues, such as self-sacrifice, loyalty, and compassion. He attributed many of Japan's modern problems to the loss of these virtues when the merchant class gained power post-Meiji Restoration but he also lamented the more unpleasant aspects of the warrior class. He was Chinese. Need I say more? Very obvious reasons. Now, Yamaga Soko was a little bit different. He was a ronin. That means a samurai without a master and a strategist during the Tokugawa area, era rather, and he delved extensively into matters relating to Bukyo, 
a warrior's creed, and a broader concept known as Shido, that way of the gentleman. His writings aim to codify a universal Bushido, emphasizing pure Confucian values while rejecting mystical influences from Taoism and Buddhism. Of course, Bushido was mainly a philosophy, but depending on who you asked, there was certainly quite a lot of theological influence. I mean, let's look at the codes of chivalry in our Western traditions, because we simply must compare the two. One of the requirements of the code of chivalry is to honor God and the Church. In fact, I believe three of the tenets of chivalry in our medieval tradition is explicitly making mention of the Church or God. Now, the rest of them are simply in terms of moral and martial conduct. But, you see, Yamaga was mainly bringing it back to a more secular ideal. But it wasn't just that. See, Yamaga's ideas, which included an absolute devotion to the emperor, regardless of rank or clan, challenged the reigning shogunate, and it led to his exile in the Arco domain. You see, the shogunate had their own ideas about what Bushido conduct should be, and when somebody goes against the narrative, they generally did not enjoy that. Now, his work was not widely read until the rise of nationalism in the early 20th century. But, if you can get your hands on them, they provide a bit of a radical perspective on Bushido. And it just goes to show that often it was up to the individual interpretation. And of course, being a ronin, a masterless samurai, well, you had a little bit more freedom of thought. Now, we can't make mention of Japanese nationalism without mentioning Yukio Mishima. If you know who that is, then you are a person of taste and culture. Well, you see, Yukio Mishima, if you're not familiar with him, was a prominent author, but not just that, a martial artist, a bodybuilder, a philosopher, pretty much everything you could think of he was doing, and he was very good at all of them. Doing his best to exemplify in the modern era the ideals of what a samurai would have been, Musashi would have been quite proud. You see, Mishima was stressing that Bushido was not inherently tied to invasionism or militarism. Instead, he defined a man of Bushido as someone with a strong sense of self-respect and accountability for their actions. Radical accountability. But also a willingness to sacrifice for their principles. And sacrifice he certainly did. Well, he essentially attempted to start a coup and bring back the samurai virtues, but that's a very long story for another video. Now, the Chinese writer Zhou Zuoren criticized the militaristic interpretation of Bushido, considering it as a corruption of a once noble tradition. In his 1935 essay series, Ruben Guangkui, Ruben is what the Chinese refer to as uh, Japan, land of the rising sun. Well, in this essay series, he discussed the act of seppuku and its importance in traditional samurai practices, contrasting it with contemporary events like the Sakai incident and the assassination of Prime Minister Inukai Tsuyoshi in 1932. 
Joe condemned the lack of responsibility displayed by the latter incidents, compared to the traditional samurai ethos of pure accountability. Of course, this all stems from the concept of Bushido experiencing a resurgence in the mid-1800s, intertwined with Japan's new nationalistic sentiments, particularly in response to Western imperialism, such as Britain's invasion of China in the First Opium War. This resurgence continued with the rise of xenophobia towards Westerners in Japan during the 1850s and 1860s, contributing to the perceived legitimacy of imperial restoration. While Bushido did fade a little bit in the 1870s, it re-emerged in the 1880s amid concerns about the erosion of traditional values due to westernization. After the Meiji Restoration, martial arts etiquette represented by Okusawa Ryu became popularized, aligning with nationalistic ideals prevalent before 1941. Martial arts, influenced by Bushido, were seen as a new way to preserve traditional values and foster national unity against modernizations. Figures like Kano Jigoro emphasized the importance of passing on the samurai spirit through practices like judo to maintain Japan's unique cultural identity. During the interbellum period and the Second World War in Showa area Japan, Bushido was utilized to promote militarism and justify war as a means of purification, framing death as a duty and an honor. It was portrayed as a way to revitalize traditional values and transcend modernity. Leaders like General Hideki Tojo one of the most evil men who ever lived, by the way, sorry for butting in there, emphasized the importance of Bushido in instilling discipline and determination among soldiers, even resorting to physical punishment to enforce its principles. Tojo and other military figures promoted the idea of Japan as a totalitarian national defense state governed by the spirit of Bushido, claiming that it gave Japanese soldiers superior willpower compared to their enemies. This concept of Bushido was invoked to inspire unity and resolve in the face of adversity, even as Japan faced setbacks like the loss at the Battle of Atu. Well, the belief in Bushido also led the Japanese forces to reject surrender as cowardly, considering it a loss of honor and dignity. Surrendered soldiers were often mistreated by the Japanese, reflecting the disdain for those who did not adhere to this code of Bushido. This mindset contributed to the brutal treatment of prisoners of war and civilians in Japanese custody across the board. In fact, it was an order, in many cases, to make sure that the prisoners of war and the civilians and the other slaves would receive the worst treatment possible. Certainly a long way from Miyamoto Musashi, isn't it? Well, that is for a more modern history video. And I don't like to end on that note. I think that we should take the ideas of Bushido and look at the good things about it, not just think about its final uses in the Second World War context. 
let's think about it as more of a philosophical thing. Perhaps something we can utilize in business. Something that we can take the good things out of. But indeed, the code itself is a, a bit of a stain on its name in our more modern history. Well, with that, I'd like to thank my Mega Chad tier patrons, that is, Stark Factory and JC, for their help. And I'd like to thank you, listener, for listening all this way. Didn't we have fun? We did, didn't we? Now, if you would like to support the channel, why not go and check out the Patreon? I'll even give you a shout-out on the next video. Otherwise, like, comment, subscribe, you know what to do. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you kindly. Good night, everyone.